Well, good morning. It's a privilege for me to introduce our speaker. I've known him for a number of years, and we have been together on different occasions and had a lot of fun together, as you'll find out. Uh, Reverend Bill Butterworth is the president of Bill Butterworth Company. He holds a bachelor's degree from Florida Bible College and master's degrees from both Dallas Theological Seminary and Florida Atlantic University. He was on the faculty of the Florida Bible College for eight years and was director of counseling ministries for Insight for Living for seven. He now devotes himself full time to encouraging people through speaking, writing, and ghostwriting. As a writer, he has written or ghostwritten over three dozen books. Over a million people uh, know Bill as a regular contributor to Home Life, Moody Monthly, and Focus on the Family's Single Parent Magazine. For close to 30 years, he's traveled full time speaking to hundreds of audiences including Fortune 500 clients like Microsoft, Walt Disney, Ford, FedEx, Chrysler, Bank of America, and Verizon, as well as over 50 professional sports teams in the NFL, NBA, and the MLB. In the world of public speaking, he was honored with the Hal Holbrook Award uh, presented by the International Platform Association. And he's also one of the select few to be called the top rated speaker of the year. He serves currently on the Board of Directors of Insight for Living, as well as the Board of Directors for the Mount Hermon Conference Center out in Felton, California. Bill, it's a pleasure to have you back at DTS. Would you please join me in welcoming Bill Butterworth? All right, I'll talk slow while Dr. Bailey gets off the platform here. What a treat to be here. Um, I don't want to tell you how long ago it was that I was a student here, but I remember uh, thinking at the time, it seemed like everybody that surrounded me in the classroom was either headed towards the pastorate or a missionary, and I was firmly convinced that I wasn't going to be either, which gave me a wonderful identity crisis for all my time at Dallas Seminary. And here I am years later, and I can say to you, I've never been on the staff of a church, and I've never been on a foreign mission field. I, I pulled it off, and I'm able to pay my mortgage and feed my kids, and, you know, God is good. So I'm, I'm really delighted uh, to represent uh, an unusual vocational approach uh, to a Dallas Seminary degree. I love this school. It's a real privilege to be back. I want to thank Dr. Allen for inviting me and being with Dr. Bailey. It's uh, really a great time. Um, let me give you a little bit of a look at what part of the year might look for a guy who is a quote unquote full-time speaker and writer. In the summertime, when my five children were still at home, uh, the family would do a lot of traveling together. And one of the engagements that we would often do is a week-long family camp ministry at a Christian conference center. That's where Dr. Bailey and I had some fun uh, out on the East Coast. Uh, there is a, a conference center on the West Coast, just outside of Los Angeles, up in the Big Bear, Lake Arrowhead uh, region. And so when my family lived in Southern California, we just loaded the van, which we called the Butter Bus, and we just headed up the mountain to this particular conference center. And the way it would work would be it would begin Sunday night and uh, the kids would go to their age appropriate uh, meetings and meet their teachers and the adults would have presentations and there were always two speakers, the evening speaker and the morning speaker. And I always wanted to be the morning speaker so that I could fool around with my kids in the afternoon and not feel like I had to take a nap, you know, because I had to speak at night. That would be Dr. Bailey's job uh, to <laughs> nap and speak. And so... Um, it didn't come out real well, did it? Uh, <laughs> so it's Monday morning, and I've given my first presentation, and the family is all brought back together again at lunch in the dining room. And my kids, classic illustration of child psychology and reverse psychology. My kids come back and say, Dad, you won't believe what the teachers told us today. I said, what? They said, boys and girls, don't let your parents take you up to the lake this summer. There's something new at the lake that's scary. It's called the blob. Don't go up to the lake. And of course, what are the kids gonna say? So can we eat real quick and go up to the lake? 
So we gobble our lunch and we go up to the lake and we meet the blob. Now, who knows what the blob is just by saying blob? Excellent. This is why Dallas Seminary has the cream of the crop. You know the blob. If you don't know what a blob is, let me try to give you the old educational principle, give you the unknown by telling you about the known. Remember when we were little and we used to go down the river in the uh, inflated inner tubes? Same kind of thing, except instead of a donut, a blob is a giant hot dog, all right? Maybe about 10 feet wide, about 30 feet long, made of rubber. <laughs> you inflate it, you put it in a lake, you put one side by the high dive, you put the other end out in the center of the lake, and the way you do the blob is one by one, people jump off the high dive, boom, land on the back end of the blob, scooch up to the front, give an okay sign for the next person to jump off and land on the back of the blob. And what this does to the kid in the front of the blob, in blob terminology, is launch them. Okay? And they go flying in the air, arms and legs flailing, and land in the lake, and there's a certain segment of the population that thinks this is really fun. So, this is 100 years ago. Arnold T. Blob had just invented the device. There were still some glitches, all right? First glitch. You ever jump in that inner tube after it's been baking in the sun for a couple hours? That is one hot inner tube. That was one hot blob. Easy solve. Custodian comes out, puts a garden hose on the high dive, spraying the blob. Problem solved. It is no longer a hot blob. New problem. That is one slippery blob. <laughs> so here are children, not known for their patience, lining up for hours to get their shot at the blob. And they jump off the high dive and bloop, slip right off, paddle to shore and get in line again. Bloop. You know, this is becoming the week-long challenge. Can you actually make it to the front of the blob to be launched? And as the week goes on, they get a little further out, and then, boom, they get the, you know, the, the kid you got to feel the sorriest for is the kid. Lands on the back, manages us all the way out to the front. While he's giving the okay sign, he slides <laughs> off the front of the blob. Now, that is frustration. Now, I tell this story with a degree of pride because my oldest son, Jesse, who's about 10 years old at the time, was one of the first to navigate the blob. He landed on the back, got all the way out to the front, gave the OK sign, and I'm as proud as a dad can be until I look up on the high dive and see who's going to launch my son. This presented a second glitch in blob technology, what became later known as the importance of small weight differential. <laughs> the person that was gonna launch my son wasn't even a kid, it was an adult. It was an adult I met right after my first session Monday morning, he came up to me, he said, Bill Butterworth, I thought I remembered your name. Do you remember me? I used to play in the NFL. I was on the Raiders. <laughs> I was a lineman. I've gained a little weight, but don't you remember me? This is the person that's gonna launch my son. He jumps off the blob, he hits the back. Jesse gives new meaning to the word launch. Radar picked him up in Albuquerque and we believe he landed in West Texas, and he got all the way back to California and said what only a kid would say, that was great, can we do it again? <laughs> now, there's another reason why I tell you the story of the blob, and that is to illustrate an idea that I'd love to just unpack with you for a little bit. I mean, oftentimes people ask, well, now wait a minute, what do you say when you talk to Microsoft or Disney or, you know, I gave you all the important names. I recently keynoted the National Portable Toilet Convention. I mean, so there's, there's plenty of, you know, latitude in my speaking career. What do you tell people like that? And I say, I think one thing, no matter where you are, you're always wrestling with the issue of balance. Balancing life. Whether you're at the bottom of the organizational chart or the very top whether you're just getting started with your family or whether you're a great, great grandparent, whether you are eminently successful, got more money than anybody you know, or just barely able to cover the rent. Balance always seems to be an issue. Now in eighth grade science, they taught us about balance in how it relates to the blob. 
What you want to do to achieve balance with the blob is to maintain what our science teachers called dynamic equilibrium, which we know as balance. You want to keep equal from both sides. But there's a reason why we struggle, and that's a more familiar eighth grade science term, gravity. Gravity is pulling you every direction and you're trying to stay on top, but you're being pulled. Now, I always love to start with that as the analogy because when I talk to people about balance versus imbalance, it would be much easier to talk about getting balance in your life if you told me on a private conversation, it's all messed up. I spend so much time using and selling illegal drugs. You know, it's just killing me. And you know, these I, I love to rob banks, it's kind of a, aside for me, and I spent so much time. If there were bad things that were making us imbalanced, it'd be a lot easier to achieve balance, wouldn't it? But it's good things, just like gravity is a good thing. My kids used to say, gravity is our friend, Dad. They taught us that in school. You're grateful for gravity this morning or you'd be up on the ceiling in a very uncomfortable position. So how do you balance life? Here in the context of a seminary, we can also take advantage of the scriptures. Wouldn't it be great if there was a paradigm in scripture that characterized what balanced living looks like? Well, that would be. Well, wouldn't it be great if there was someone who was a classic model of a balanced life? Well, that would be. Well, the first name that comes to mind is the Lord Jesus. He kind of pulled things off perfectly, if you know what I mean. And so if you allow for imbalance to be part of his humanity, how did he maintain balance in his years on earth? So I set out reading the four gospels, looking for what I was, what I was calling a typical day in the life of Jesus. What did it look like, a day in the life of Jesus? Not as easy of an assignment as I thought. You know this, you know the gospels. There's not as much reference to 24-hour periods in the gospel as there are references to annual feasts and weekly Sabbaths. There's not, and Jesus awoke and went to Starbucks. You know, you, you wish there was, but as close as I can find is in Mark's gospel, chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 Beginning in the middle of verse 6, it says, Jesus was going around the villages teaching, verse 7, and he summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs, and he was giving them authority over the unclean spirits. If I can be ridiculously simplistic, because I personally believe we, balance is not rocket science, I think if we start with the most basic elements, we can help figure out how to maintain balance in life, wherever we are in life, including facing midterms as a seminary student, okay? First thing I see in Mark 6 is that he was going around the villages teaching. So if you wanna kinda of get a job description of a typical day in the life of Jesus, here's the first observation. He taught, okay? He taught, and that says to me that tasks were an important part of his life. Uh, Silly idea, if Jesus lived in a day where they carried business cards, what would Jesus' business card look like? He could have gone full bore, the Lord Jesus Christ, creator of the universe, savior of the world, Jesus at, you know, gmail.com. He could have gone full bore, but he could have gone a more simple way. He could have just put Jesus of Nazareth, teacher. He achieved tasks. Now, the reason that's important to me is having grown up in church, the classic church kid, my idea of Jesus in my growing up years was that Jesus just was the head of the disciples. And so he discipled. And what was discipling? And as I would describe it as a kid, he just kind of hung out. He woke up every morning. He said to the 12, hi, guys, let's hang. Well, what are we going to do? I don't know. Maybe we'll see somebody sick along the way. But I don't know. Let's, let's just hang. And so it was kind of an uninvolved kind of Jesus in that way. But here we see he taught. There was activity. There was a task involved. The very next verse says, he summoned the 12 and he began to send them out. Okay? So first of all, not only did he teach, but secondly, he interacted. That's the Jesus that I grew up with. That says to me that relationships were important, okay? 
He had tasks in which he was involved. He had relationships in which he was involved. Now, let's stop there. If you've ever worked for a company that brought in the famous organizational psychologist to come in to give the classic motivation to the upper management about, you too have leadership potential, you can be great, and if you'll just buy my book for $38.95, it will give you the 12 masters. To, you know, and you hear these organizational psychologists, something they've been saying for years and years and years, which is pretty accurate if you ask me, Leaders with potential fall into one of two categories, and you can pretty much divide the room in half. Half of us are what we would call task-oriented leaders. It's all about the job. The other half of us are relationship-oriented leaders. It's all about the relationships. Interestingly enough, your boss gives you an assignment. Complete this task, you have six weeks to do it. All right, task-oriented person, to six weeks, they see a calendar in their head. This is what we'll have done by week two. This is what we'll have done by week four. We're gonna have the whole thing done by week five, and then we have a whole week for damage control, just in case we're behind, all right? You give the same assignment to a relationship-oriented manager, six weeks. I can't do this by myself. I need a team. I need a dream team. I need Frank from accounting, and I need Sandra in, you know, uh, web design, and I need, and they build all these, and then we'll celebrate at the end of six weeks with a giant party with lots of food. Big food element to relationship-oriented <laughs> leaders, okay? Now, you probably know what you are. Half of us are task-oriented, half of us are relationship-oriented. I want to emphasize both equally effective. Both get the job done, but there's been a different emphasis. Task are they're cranking it out, relationship, they're cranking it out, and they celebrate with the giant party. Now, let's address the elephant in the room. Task-oriented people don't like relationship-oriented people. Amen. <laughs> this guy follows me around everywhere I go. He just gives me that. <laughs> Right when I need it. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Beware, though. Relationship-oriented people don't care for task-oriented people. All right? By the way, if you're still stuck on, I don't know what I am. Task-oriented people, you have a great tell. It's you love to keep to-do lists. Okay? You got it on your phone or on your laptop or even old-school 3 by 5 card. You write down everything you want to do during the day. And nothing could be more exhilarating, well, except for one thing putting that little check by each little thing that you accomplish, all right? That is the outstanding moment of the day, all right? You're a task-oriented person, all right? And task-oriented people, these relationship people drive me crazy. I want to get the job done, and they're always calling meetings. Let's have a meeting about this. Let's discuss this. Come, I'll bring bagels. You know, it's like, what's the deal? I want to get this done, but they keep making it about meetings. And the relationship-oriented people, they say, oh, you task-oriented people, you're pathetic. You're cold. You're distant. You're aloof. You're alone. <laughs> task-oriented quickly respond. I'm not alone. Got it right here on my list. Make a friend. <laughs> now, again, just... Keeping it very, very basic, let me ask you a question. How many times does a task-oriented person lay his or head, uh, her head on the pillow at night thinking, wow, what a great day. I got everything checked off my list, followed by, and I don't think I spoke to a soul. And how many times has a relationship-oriented person put their head on the pillow and said, man, what a great day. I had breakfast with Charlie, and I had lunch with Sally, and we had deli for mid-afternoon break, and we're going to have ribs tomorrow night. It's great. Followed by, I got to get some stuff done. <laughs> I mean, we make balance and imbalance so complicated. I mean, I think it's built into our nature. Task-oriented people don't automatically build relationships into their life. Relationship-oriented people don't have as their default mode getting things done. And that's where imbalance occurs. Jesus had both. He taught and he interacted. And how did he pull that off? 
because of a very important third aspect of his life. And it's all the way down in verse 31, where it says, Jesus said to the disciples, come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. He taught, he interacted, and third, he found time alone. He found time alone. That says to me that privacy was an important part of his life. Solitary introspection, reflection, the spiritual discipline of silence. Solitary? Isn't that the, that's a bad word, right? That, that's the worst thing they do to prisoners. You've really messed up. Throw that person into solitary. If you're a parent, you know what that's all about. You go to your room, young lady. You think about what you've done. No, daddy, no, daddy. No, you, you listen to me. You go to your room. You think about what you've done. Go to your room. Watch the small TV. <laughs> it's tough love, darling. As opposed to solitary time, quiet time, alone with God, being that fount that helps you see, you know what, I'm so wrapped up in what I'm doing, I'm forgetting about my spouse, I'm forgetting about my kids, I'm forgetting about my involvement with my small group, or, you know, I don't even have time for a small Or it's, wow, I have so many friends, but, you know, I let, I, this happens to me every semester. I wait till the very end, and all of a sudden I have 3,488 pages to read, and that many pages to write. It's like, this is beyond human dignity. It's imbalanced just by the way we're wired. God, can you help me in this way? That's a day in the life of Jesus. So let's talk about a day in your life. What's a day look like in your life? Let me use those three ideas and give you three little words that have a little bit more of a rhythm and rhyme to them to see if that can help you in your quest to be a balanced woman or a balanced man, okay? First word I'd have you write down is the word attention. Attention. And by that I mean giving attention to the tasks in your life. Attention. My very favorite verse on tasks are Peter's words in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. And I'm reading from New American Standard. I especially love the way it's translated in that version. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Each of us have been given a gift, and so we employ it. That's why, that's why I love that translation, that phrase, that verb. Employ it. It speaks of being employed of I work to demonstrate my gift. One theologian described work as taking the raw material of creation and developing it for the sake of others. Taking the raw material of creation and developing it for the sake of others. Now, this is important to me because, again, I grew up in a culture that when we talked about imbalance in life, the blame was always the job. You know what? You're being a lousy husband, or you're being a lousy wife, or you're being a lousy mom or dad because you work too much. You're always at work. Work, work, work. And the implication is work is evil. Work is not evil. Being imbalanced with too much work is evil, just like being imbalanced with not enough work is evil. Solomon called him a sluggard. That's one of those great words that just defines itself. Sluggard. <laughs> All right? Solomon wrote in Proverbs 26, as the door turns on its hinges, so does the lazy man on his bed. My favorite word picture. This guy is so lazy, he's hinged to his bed. In bed, come out, get a cup of coffee, he's back in. Come out, use the bathroom, come back. He's hinged to his bed. You're saying that sounds pretty good to me right now. <laughs> but here's the issue I always like to raise. If you're not hinged to your bed, to what are you hinged? Something is creating imbalance in your life. And work's not a bad thing. 
When I first started speaking to companies and corporations, it was a long time ago, it was about 940 technologies ago, and I remember as I would speak to a crowd of successful businessmen and women, the big technology was um, beepers, you know, pagers. These guys, they'd sit there and they'd see, and I'd sit there and all of a sudden hear beep, beep, and some guy would pull his jacket back and walk away, oh man, that guy's important, he got paged right out of the meeting. And I got jealous, you know. Here I am, I'm self-employed. The Bill Butterworth Company is in its entirety before you right now. <laughs> and I'm thinking, man, these guys. So I decided to take matters into my own hands. Didn't buy a pager, because who's gonna page me? There's no reason nobody's gonna page me. But smart enough, I started traveling around, and sure enough, I'd speak, and all of a sudden I'd hear beep, 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 and I just would always go, Actually, I was carrying my garage door opener. <laughs> and I'd look at that and go, you know, I'll handle that later. And think, whoa, this guy's important, you know. No idea that simply a garage door is opening in Southern California, you know. <laughs> but work matters. Work really is important. What are you doing with the gift that you have? Now, all of us have gifts. You know the New Testament texts. You know the lineup. But would you be willing to take it even a little bit farther and say, you know, there are specifics to those gifts that are unique to you. The, the, the most obvious one that I always like to use is many of you know you have the gift of teaching. But what is it about your teaching that makes you unique, that makes people want to come back? What is it about the teaching of one of your professors that makes them more of a favor to you than another professor? That's probably not a fair question with professors in attendance. But what is it about your unique style that makes you memorable? Hopefully not some, well, I love this guy because he always reminded me of the way so-and-so used to teach. No, 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 no. Your style, what is it about you, okay? That's what's significant. What is your mission? Why do I work? You know, when my kids were young, I have a daughter and four sons. I remember when they were teenagers and school would be out for the summer and they would sleep throughout the day and I, I wanted to be a model of them. I remember I'd come in, especially the boys, I'd come in and late in the afternoon, I'd say, boys, boys, it's time to wake up. Look at me, I'm your dad. Look what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave and I'm gonna come back in a few days with money. You can do this too, boys. You should be doing this too, boys, you know? And whether they ever caught on is another subject for another day. But basically, we want to be a model to them that work is a good thing. So if you are real highly task-oriented, don't think, oh boy, I'm just cursed because I just love to work. I work, work. That's a good thing. It's just the overuse, the imbalance of work that will be an issue. So that's number one. That's attention. Number two is connection. That's the relationship angle of our life. Jesus said it in his farewell address in John 13. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We get it. We know that verse, probably by heart. But do we love in the way Jesus wants us to. We love because we want to give of ourselves to someone else. One of the words that's old school now, but I, I was alive when it seemed to first get coined this way, was the term network. I love to network. And I remember the first people I knew who were really into networking gave me a bad taste in my mouth because networking to me was code for, I need your name and contact information because I'm gonna need you to do something for me someday and I wanna know how to get a hold of you. And it was very usury. And that's not what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about relationship. A, a, a big file in your contact info so that you, people can be used. No, 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 it's how you can help them and how you can be bonded with one another. Um, I was speaking at Mount Hermon um, years and years and years ago with Chuck, and Chuck had just gotten back from one of these 
super cool male bonding fishing trips that he did with all these Christian heavy hitters. Hey, I just went salmon fishing with Jim Dobson and Chuck Colson. And, you know, he's, uh, he's not a name dropper, but it's like, whoa, whoa, was there any flunky there? I mean, did someone just bait the hook? I mean, this is incredible, you know? And he just kept talking about This guy came up to me and he said, boy, Chuck's really excited about that fishing trip. I said, yeah, yeah. He said, you know, well, it's cool. The guys are getting together. And uh, this guy, and we just met, he said, do, do you fish? I said, yeah, and I'm a city. I grew up in Philadelphia. We did not a little lot of fishing. Well, do you hunt? I said, no, I grew up in Philadelphia. We carried guns for a completely different reason. <laughs> he said, do you like to camp out? I said, well, if that means a Marriott, you know. <laughs> How about golf? I said, oh, I like to play golf. I'm really no good. My motto at golf is every club, every hole. But um, <laughs> he says, yeah, I like to play golf. Let's play golf. He says, you grab somebody, I'll grab somebody, and we'll go play golf. We'll just do a long weekend, and we'll bond. I said, man, that's, that's really cool. And um, I bring that up because in a month, we're going to get together for our 30th year of playing golf together on a long weekend. It's great. I'm the youngest guy in the group. We used to play 18 holes of golf and then another nine and then two hours of tennis and then, you know, card games late at night. And I'm the youngest. Nowadays, we play nine holes of golf spread out over the four days. <laughs> we see a lot of movies and we know everything there is to know about Medicare and issues of the body that one would not discuss in another group. But we got that bond. We're together. Before I passed away, I got, I got to hear uh, Rabbi Kushner tell this story, the guy that wrote When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Marvelous storyteller. It's the story of a man sitting on a beach watching a boy and a girl play in the sand. They were building an elaborate sandcastle. Just when they had almost finished, a big wave came along, knocked the sandcastle down, reduced it to wet mud. The man was sure they would burst out crying. All their hard work had gone to waste. But the children fooled them. They didn't cry. They actually ran up the shore laughing and holding hands and sat down to build another sandcastle. And the man realized the important lesson that children had taught him. No matter how good you are, no matter how smart you are, sooner or later, a wave will come and knock down what you've worked so hard to build up. And when that happens, only the person who has somebody's hand to hold will be able to laugh. Connection. Don't become isolated through imbalance into anything, any good thing. Don't forget reflection. So we have attention, we have connection, and then the last one is reflection. That time where you zoom in on what's important in your spiritual life and ask God to help you with balance in life. Isaiah wrote in chapter 30, in quietness and trust is your strength. So think about it this way. Again, if there's any full-time church kid in the crowd who grew up with all the good teaching of a good church, like me, as a child, I was taught how to pray. You pray for the missionaries, you pray for your leaders, you pray for the people that are sick, you pray for the people that don't know Jesus. And I would do that all the time, fervently. And I'd take nothing away from that list. Those are all good things. But I would be embarrassed to tell you how old I was as an adult before I finally realized, you know what, I can also pray, dear Lord, you know how task-oriented I am. So would you bring people into my life today so magnetic, they just draw me to them so that I am sucked in to relationship in a healthy way. Or you know, I, I, I owe my son, my daughter, big time, catch up. Help me to catch up, all right? Or you pray, Lord, I'm so relational, I'm not getting anything done. Give me strength today, Lord, to put a do not disturb sign on my office door, to only check my email at the end of the day, to turn my phone off and trust that the country, yea, the world, will survive <laughs> till dinner. Because I got to get some stuff done. Who said you could never pray for that? 
It's an important thing. So, last thing to think about is a visual. What I suggested was an equilateral triangle, attention, connection, and reflection. When you see an equilateral triangle, almost all of us think of a pyramid. I want you to flip that over so it looks more like a shield. You got a long top part going down to a point, okay? And you have attention on one side, connection on the other, and you have reflection down at the bottom. It is the fulcrum that will help us achieve the balance that we need to achieve. So again, not rocket science, but I believe it actually will move you forward in the right direction. You'll maintain your balance on the blob and you'll be flying around, flailing your arms and your legs before you even know it. Let's pray. Lord, for each and every student in this room this morning, I just pray that you would help them in their individual quest for balance in life. For as many people as there are in this room, there are scenarios of things that are happening in life, perhaps out of our control, perhaps under our control, but in need of your direction and your hand. Lord, I pray we would yield ourselves to you in a way perhaps we've never done before, and that is to yield ourselves to you to be men and women characterized by balance in life. Lord, for the one who especially hurts today, I pray that you would be close, put your arms around them, hug them, and let them know they are important to you and you want to help them through the difficult times. Lord, again, I thank you for all that this school represents to me, all that I learn, all that I am grateful for. May you give it many, many more years producing wonderful students of the word who will go out and reach the world. Thank you, Lord, for our time together. In the strong name of Christ, I pray all these things. Amen.